today's lecture is um, we're going to finish up our week on oil. Talk about some natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. And when we talk about oil seeps, um, deep water reefs are um, are always they always go hand in hand. So we'll we'll see we'll see why that is as we move forward in the lecture. But that's why today we're talking about both reefs and seeps, coral and um, and natural oil seeps. Uh, I want to remind you that you have, um, so this is the first time we're going to have a homework that's due on Monday. So this is once again just reading homework. So you have two chapters that are assigned. One is actually quite short. Um, and there are three questions that have been assigned to you that are reading comprehension questions. As always, these are just participation credits. And so if you end up have, having to work this weekend and you just don't have time and you still want to get the credits, just go through and give me some sort of answer. Um, I understand that having this due on a weekend is kind of frustrating, but um, as much as I try and avoid it this weekend, I, I couldn't really switch things around. So do your best. And um, next week, we only have one lecture, and that's going to be on Monday. And Wednesday and Friday of next week are going to be um, to work on your final project. So there'll be in-class work sessions. So today, yes, joining class, our favorite guest instructor. She can stay as long as she lays down. You're fine. Let's give you a second. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about cold seeps, deep sea corals. Um, we're going to do an activity actually that's going to um, kind of step you through the process of oil permitting decisions. And we'll talk about the rigs to reef program a little bit towards the end. So the learning goals for today are to understand that the Gulf of Mexico, like other ocean basins across the world, has many active natural oil and gas seafloor seeps. That the chemical processes involved in devouring the hydrocarbons causes um, by bacteria causes calcium carbonate rock to form near the surface of the seafloor at these vents. And then when you have adequate currents that carry sediment away from those rocks, the exposed rocks actually become really good places for larvae to settle and grow, including coral. And you'll learn that the Rigs to Reef program is a practice of converting decommissioned offshore oil and petroleum rigs into artificial reefs, and it can provide some pretty important reef habitat um, in the Gulf of Mexico. So today is a deep sea class, and you might be asking, hey, I thought this class was coastal oceanography. And it absolutely is. Um, it's mostly coastal oceanography. But oil is so important in the Gulf of Mexico, and it means that we can't, can't get around studying oil. And when we're studying oil, it um, actually kind of leads to some very interesting deep sea features that are associated with that oil. And so it makes sense that we should talk about these deep sea features as well as coastal environments, which we spend a lot of time on. So remember, the deep sea is an extreme environment. This is something that you should have learned in Intro to Oceanography. It has low temperature, high pressure, and no light. Um, food is scarce in most of the deep sea, though there are locations where you can pretty reliably find food depending on the current flow. And despite all these challenges, life actually abounds in the deep sea. You find life everywhere you look. Sometimes you find some pretty complex, large, like macro organisms, like coral, um, large deep sea isopods, deep sea sharks. But where those things don't exist, there's a lot. There's a large variety of smaller life that's hidden just below the sediment surface. So. Um, life does not shy away from difficult environments, and the deep sea is no exception to that. So let's talk about the deep sea environment that we are going to focus on today, and that is a cold seep environment. So the Gulf of Mexico, like many other ocean basins across the world, has many active natural oil and gas seafloor seeps, and these are areas where oil or gas leaks to the seafloor. 
up from wherever it's stored in reservoirs. It can eventually percolate up the rock and through the sediment and reach the seafloor where it bubbles up like in this, this photo here. A cold seep, which sometimes gets called a cold vent, is an area of the ocean floor where you get um, various gases like hydrogen sulfide and methane, which are associated with oil reservoirs. And also you can get um, leakage of hydrocarbon rich fluid itself, the oil itself. Um, seeps out of these vents. And so these are a little bit different from a hydrothermal vent, which is another vent you might be more familiar with. At a hydrothermal vent, the water is superheated and that's what causes it to rise um, up out of the rock and sediment and into the ocean. In these areas, um, there's not much heating involved. Certainly these materials are not superheated. They're just less dense than the surrounding rock, and so when there's um, some sort of opening in the rock, these will leak up. So the oil and the gas that's leaking up at these locations um, is doing so because of density differences, not because necessarily it's a superheated um, fluid or gas. When you get um, oil and gas seeping up through the sediments at a cold seep environment, there are bacteria, as we've learned, that specialize in feeding on hydrocarbons. And so at the, in these seep sediments, these bacteria, as you imagine, would do really well because there's lots of food available. And so um, they will consume the oil and gas voraciously. And the chemical processes involved in devouring these hydrocarbons um, the, the thing that these bacteria do, it causes calcium carbonate rock to form near the surface of the seafloor. And that's because calcium and magnesium are things that are not used up by the bacteria or they're byproducts of the bacteria consuming the oil. And so these will actually increase in concentration so much that they precipitate out of the liquid and they'll build up as rock material, um, resulting in hard bottom and mound-like carbonate buildups. So here's a picture of one right here. This is a piece of calcium carbonate rock at a cold seep, and it's colonized by a variety of sea creatures, as you can see here. So wherever you have adequate sediment that these features don't get buried, or I'm sorry, adequate currents that these features don't get buried by sediment, then you get exposed rock, which can lead to a lot of opportunities for organisms that need places to attach. And so these would be like mussels, a variety of worms, certainly corals. Um, so they become really good places for various larvae to settle and grow, including corals. At the most active seep sites, um, you get a thriving community of chemosynthetic organisms. And so chemosynthesis is just the synthesis of organic compounds, so making organic food, by bacteria and sometimes other living organisms, but mostly bacteria. And these organisms use energy derived from reactions involving inorganic chemicals, and they don't require sunlight, typically. So um, this is making food using chemical substances without the requirement of sunlight. At cold seeps, you get a variety of clams, mussels, and tube worms that have bacteria living in their tissue at various places in their tissue. It can be in their gills, it can be in their stomachs. Um, many organisms have evolved instead of a stomach, they get essentially a sac where their stomach used to be and it's just filled with these bacteria. And the bacteria will consume oil, natural gas, and hydrogen sulfide from the water and provide energy for their host organisms. Over time, you get changes in these communities. So you get a community forming when a seep forms, and then um, more competitive organisms will move in eventually and replace those organisms that first uh, colonized the seep site and so what you get is a process of ecological succession. And that is just a process that describes how the structure of a biological community can change over time. And so we see this in forests, right? So if you clear cut a forest, initially you get weeds kind of growing 
And those weeds, they come in really fast, but they're not going to compete when, they're, when they start to be shaded by some larger plants. And those plants aren't going to compete well when they are starting to be shaded by trees. So you get ecological succession, and you've probably seen examples of this um, for yourself. And this occurs at deep sea vents as well. So um, what you get is initially bacteria colonizing the site. So a, a seep fluid flow begins, and then you get bacteria colonizing the site in this first step here. And then you get um, bristle worms that are growing up and feeding on those bacteria. And that's this like gray, gray mat here is all those bristle worms. Finally, or not finally, then you get some clam beds that start to form. So clams will colonize the area along with those bristle worms. And these clams can have um, chemosynthetic properties. They can have back associations with bacteria. You get calcium carbonate rock beginning to form then. And um, when that rock forms, you can get the colonization by things that depend on rock, like tube worms. And so these would be the charismatic deep sea vent organisms that we all know and love. Um, there are a variety of different types of tube worms, and they, um, they're special because the deep sea um, vent tube worms have those, flu those sacs instead of their stomachs that house chemosynthetic bacteria. And so that's how they feed. When you build up enough of that calcium carbonate rock, you can develop muscle beds. And then um, finally, the climax community, which simply means um, the final community of organisms that exists at the end of the ecological succession. Um, the climax community in this case are deep water corals and other sessile animals that eventually colonize the rock but only after um, seepage has pretty much subsided. So there's not very much um, oil and gas seepage going on. And the chemosynthetic organisms have died off. And so this takes a lot of time to get to the point where you have a healthy coral community at the end of this ecological succession. So these are steps through time. Bacteria colonization, bristle worms, clam beds, calcium carbonate rock with tube worms, mussel beds, and corals. And in your um, quiz question, I'm going to ask you to sort these. So take a second just to write down some notes and try and get it clear in your, in your mind what comes first. Of course, the bacteria comes first and the corals come last, right? But um, the steps in between can be... A little bit more tricky. So bristle worms are going to be quite different from tube worms. They're much smaller. Um, it's just going to be a patch of, of ground that um, have some worms in it. Tube worms are those large, um, those large worms. They're usually red in color and they, um, I think I have a picture of them. Um, but anyways, there are large worms, they have um, reddish coloration, and they build these um, long tubes to stick up from the rock. So there needs to be rock there for the two worms to form. So this is more towards the end of the succession. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do our quiz. The following events describe parts of the succession of cold seeps. Sort the events in time from early to late succession. Yes, can you hear her purring? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> she won't go away. She's my, she's my old lady. She's 13 years old, so she kind of gets what she wants now. <laughs> I've given up on trying to train her or to get her to do things that I want her to do. She's too old for that. Can't believe the microphone picks that up, though. That's true. Yes. 
She does deserve to learn oceanography. She likes fish, so. All right, got one person that um, hasn't clicked submit, so make sure that you've clicked submit. I'm going to end this soon. Well, thank you guys for being so welcoming, because if I kick her off my lap, she's just going to come right back. I have to kick her out of the room, and I'd feel really bad, because it's cold today. Alright, we're going to go ahead and end this. Oh, good job. Got it in the last minute. Okay, so um, the correct order is the most popular order that you all chose here. Um, bacteria begins to grow, a bristle worm bed forms. Calcium carbonate rock begins to form, and tube worms colonize, and then corals colonize. Very, very good. All right, so um, corals. Let's talk a little bit about deep sea corals. Um, I don't know how many of you realized that corals can live in the deep sea, um, but they actually can. We always think about shallow water, like tropical, colorful corals when we think about corals, but um, they can be deep sea organisms too. So a coral is an animal, in case um, you need some, some reminders. A coral is an animal. It's closely related to sea anemones and jellyfish. Um, you can see the polyps of a coral right here. It looks very much like a sea anemone. And um, kind of like an upside down jellyfish. So they're all, they're all pretty closely re related. Um, and... Warm water corals that we typically think about have algal symbionts that help provide food through photosynthesis. And so that's what gives these the shallow water, warm water corals their color. But over half of all known coral species do not grow in shallow water. They actually grow in cold, dark, deep water habitats. Cold water corals um, show up as white because what we're seeing is just the coral tissue. We're not looking at algal symbionts here. Um, they don't have algal symbionts. They live in the dark. And so there's no point in having algae that can photosynthesize. Instead, the way they eat is they have to use their tentacles to catch small organic particles. And they have some things to help them with this. So their tentacles have harpoon-like stinging cells on them. That's not unique to deep water corals. So shallow water corals have this too. In fact, shallow water corals will feed in this way at, um, during the nighttime, especially when um, their algal symbionts are not photosynthesizing. So this is something that all corals do. It's just deep water corals really have to rely on this as a way to gain food. Because they live in cold environments and their metabolism is slowed, and because food may not be as plentiful without those algal symbionts, corals in the deep sea actually grow much slower than warm water species. And we know that warm water species are already grow pretty slow already, so deep water corals can take a really long time to grow. Um, Lophelia pertusa, which is pictured here, um, the polyps and the coral itself, is a um, very common deep sea reef building coral. And I only mention this because Lophelia shows up in your activity today. So I'll give you a, a mental image of what that looks like. It's important to note that corals coral larvae require hard substrate to settle. And so um, hard substrate's a bit hard to come by in the deep sea. You get mostly mud in the deep sea, um, but you get calcium carbonate rocks at seeps. And so in many areas, the calcium carbonate rocks that form in seeps are the only hard substrates available for deep water coral communities. And that's why you see so many of these communities um, as a end stage successional uh, type of community found at seep in seep environments. So this this Lophelia here is attached to a calcium carbonate rock that formed at a seep. Currents are really important for deep sea corals. Um, so there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, when coral reproduce, the sperm and egg cells are released into the water. And so they need favorable currents, otherwise fertilization might not ever occur. 
those um, eggs and sperm will just hang out by the coral that released them and they won't mix and you might you won't get fertilization larvae use the currents to drift until they find something hard to settle on and without currents on the bottom of the gulf of mexico hard surfaces would eventually become buried by sediment so currents also lift sediment off of those rocks and open up that uh, that habitat for corals to settle as i mentioned before polyps use their tentacles to capture food as it floats by and so if they can be located in an area with more current that current will bring more food past their tentacles and allow them to grow faster and so those currents can be really important in terms of food delivery and as you learned way back in lecture four which seems like ages ago um, but we learned that the bottom currents in the gulf of mexico are not very well understood and they can be quite difficult to study if you'll recall um, at least the honor students were required to learn about um, deep sea drifters and how deep sea currents can be elucidated through the use of drifters but that technology is expensive and we don't really have a handle on some of the fine scale um, intricacies of currents that we would need to understand the best habitat for something like a coral um, but there are some things that we do know so we do know the following we know that more particles settle where there is no current and very few particles settle where there is a current so we can kind of predict if we know anything about the current where particles will settle and where they won't where rocks will be uncovered for coral and where they'll be buried we know that when a current encounters a wall or some sort of hill on the seafloor it speeds up so if you look at these arrows you can see that they are um, roughly moving at the same speed from top to bottom here and as they approach this hill these bottom arrows end up being further ahead than the top arrows do and if you track these arrows with your eyes the ones that are moving over that hill are moving a lot faster than the ones that are up here in the water column so that's a feature of fluid movement when it encounters some sort of restriction or some sort of um, hill you will get current speeding up they also speed up when they are moving around raised features on the seafloor so for instance if you have a current that's moving around a hill or a seamount like this those currents will speed up around there yeah i know they're locked out of the room the dogs are they're arguing about it in the hallway okay so currents speed up when they're moving around raised objects we know a current will form through a valley as it goes around some mound or hill and so you can see in this image here there are two different hills here and a valley in between them and a current will flow through that valley we know that things that settle on top of a raised feature tend to stay there and so there's this little bit of area right here on top of for instance this this um, raised feature where um, some settlement can occur so you might get some sediments that settle right here on top and if they do they are unlikely to get swept off by currents and we know that particles do not settle in a valley with a current going through it so if you have some sort of feature that is a current moving through a valley um, that valley will be continuously scoured by that current and so you tend not to get a whole lot of um, particles settling in that valley it doesn't really fill in over time if there's a current moving through it so we know some things we know some basic things about how currents impact um impact the deep sea even on a fine scale if we know something about the bathymetry about the features on the seafloor we can say something about where we think the currents are going to be strongest so that all of that information leads you to your activity for this week and this one's going to take you a while um in this activity you're going to be pretending like you are responsible for prioritizing exploratory drilling sites 
for a company that wants some oil permits. The company is Pinnacle Petroleum. So you're going to prioritize proposed drilling sites to minimize the impact to sensitive seafloor ecosystems and other resources. But the catch is we don't really know too much about where those sensitive ecosystems are. And so you're going to use your oceanography knowledge to predict where they might be. I'm going to try and step you through this process. You're going to do some map interpretation. I did my very best. Um, some of them are color. Um, they have colored information, but I have done my best to make them so um, everyone will be able to interpret the colors, even if you are colorblind. But if you have troubles, just let me know. Um, yeah, so go ahead and step through that activity and we're going to reconvene at 1117 just to wrap up um, the last couple of slides. So you have almost 20 minutes to complete this. Okay, um, it's 11.17, so hopefully you at least got through most of it. I know it was a little bit of a long activity. I had fun making it, so I kind of got out of, out of hand. But um, So I hope you saw some of the complicated decisions that have to be made when, when oil permitting is done. Um, it's not really an option to not allow oil, um, oil drilling in the deep sea. This is one of our major oil reserves and so um, humans do need this this uh, material whether we like it or not but um, it becomes really difficult to decide areas that um, are uh, not going to be ecologically impacted by such drilling if we just don't really know much about the area and we already knew quite a bit about the area where pinnacle petroleum wanted to drill and even so we still didn't know where some of those sensitive marine areas were um, so hopefully you kind of got to see the thought process where we can use what knowledge we have to try and predict areas that we need to conserve i just have a couple of more slides for you um, this one is kind of like a curiosity so i wanted to let you know that um, about another unique environment that can occur in these uh, salt dome systems. So sometimes the salt from a salt dome will become exposed to seawater where it dissolves. And um, when it dissolves in the surrounding water, it can make a mass of water that's very, very salty. And so we call this a brine pool when that salty water, which is very dense, sits on the bottom. Um, a brine pool is when that volume of really salty water can be collected in a seafloor depression. So these pools are dense bodies of water that have a salinity that's three to eight times greater than the surrounding ocean. Because of that, the water is very dense and is resistant to moving. Um, so it'll sit in that pool. And um, there is a tendency for depressions that can hold salt pools um, or brine pools to form in the Gulf of Mexico because after a salt dome is dissolved, it collapses and it can form those depressions that can hold brine pools. This adds a lot of complexity to the bathymetry in the Gulf of Mexico. And in addition to raised features that you get from the salt domes, you also get pock marks from areas where those salt domes have um, caved in. And in 2016, a brine pool called the Hot Tub of Despair was located on the seafloor in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's a roughly circular pool. You can see it's quite large, about 20 meters in diameter. And the researchers that found it found a bunch of sea creatures that had fallen in and died. And so that's why they called it the hot tub of despair. Uh, so it's a death trap for, sea, for deep sea organisms that were living right around the outside of it. So a pretty cool feature, um, probably very interesting to explore. And then finally, I wanted to tell you about another place that is very important for um, coral in the deep sea, and that is actually oil platforms. So coral will grow on other hard surfaces, such as oil platforms. And eventually these platforms become too old and they need to be decommissioned. But removing the structure from the water also removes valuable habitat for coral. So it's a conundrum. So the Rakes to Reef program has um, been converting these decommissioned offshore oil and petroleum rigs into artificial reefs. 
And the United States does a lot of this. So this program has been really popular with fishermen, the oil industry, government regulators. It's really a win-win for everybody. About 10% of decommissioned platforms have been converted to permanent reefs. And so um, this improves fishing for fishermen. They can go out there and fish on these old reefs, um, catch a lot of, a lot of large snapper, a lot of tarpon are out there. Um, divers can go out there and dive them. They're amazing diving. Um, lots of large sharks. And obviously they're habitat for coral when otherwise there wouldn't be any. So yeah, that's it for today. I'm sorry I went two minutes over. And I will see you guys on Monday. Don't forget about your um, reading homework this weekend. Have a great weekend. I'm going to the beach, so I will definitely have a great weekend. Yeah, I know. Thanks.